Uh, welcome to Sea Education Association. My name is Mark Long. I'm the academic dean here at SEA. And um, wow, um, well done. Um, we had no idea how many to expect, so we set out 40 chairs, and that was that was wrong. But thanks for being here and being patient. Um, glad you could make it. Um, Osprey are popular. That's awesome. So I'm going to introduce our director of development, Polly Lyman, who's going to just sort of tell you a bit about us, and then we'll kick it over to to the night's festivities. Thanks for being quick, here. A quick, like, 20 seconds. Hi, I'm Polly Lyman. I'm director of development here at SEA, and I don't know how many of you know about what, who we are and what we do. We, are, we provide ocean education on board two tall ships, the models of which you can see outside in, in the map room, um, studying um, uh, marine science, o ocean studies, <laughs> plastics, <laughs> coral Sorry, reefs. History. So we share a lot about caring deeply about this earth that we all share together. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we, we love being here in the community. We're not a member organization the way that the Oyster Pond is, um, but, we, but we are mostly an alumni-based organization. But we do have community events. So sometimes we will have open ships when our, with the Corth Kramer is in, in um, Woods Hole. Sometimes we even have community day sales and so we like to be in touch with everybody in the community. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And if you'd like to sign up to get information about our community day sales, I've put a little sign up sheet over there. Thank you so much. And we're so glad that you're here tonight. I will add, we also have a public lecture series that we'll be starting up. It was on hiatus during COVID, but it's coming back this year. So it'll start this academic year. So thank you for being here. Take it away. Uh, I just want to make two quick announcements, logistical things. We do have masks. If anybody would like to take one, you may help yourself. And <laughs> many of us are using canes right at the moment. So um, there is actually an accessible way to get out of this building at the end if you were struggling to get the steps in the beginning. If you go out this side door to the left, turn left, then it will go right into the parking lot here. It's all grade level. You don't have to worry about stairs. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carlos. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> well, hello everyone. My name is Alfredo Arizabreta. I'm currently the president of the board of the Oyster Point Environmental Trust. And you've heard from Chris Brothers, who is, you know, in charge of everything basically. <laughs> um, so welcome to the annual meeting. Uh, the way that it works is we go through, for those of you that may not know about uh, the Oyster Point Environmental Trust, um, we kind of have an annual meeting in which we share with the members of the trust, um, you know, updates, annual updates on, you know, what has happened during this last year. And um, after that, we have a lecture um, and in Today's case is going to be about the Osprey project with Kevin and all these things. Um, so, well, hello, thank you so much for coming here. Um, so, welcome to the Oyster Point Environmental Trust. Um, so, the first thing that, uh, that I want to say is that um, a lot has been changing over the last few years because of the pandemic and everything that has happened. And I just want to acknowledge that, you know, it has hit the community, and I think it's it's important to just acknowledge that, you know, uh, some people um, have suffered through the pandemic in, in many different ways. And uh, one thing that, in the case of OPED, it kind of has benefited. Um, it has provided the the trails of OPED have provided kind of a a, a way of escaping. Uh, a little bit of the restrictions of uh, the pandemic. So, you know, sometimes you have to see this as, uh, you know, clearly it's not going to uh, um, ease the, the, the pain that people may have suffered, but it has helped uh, a way to to kind of disconnect a little bit from, from everything that we're going through. All right, so first thing that that I wanna talk about is about uh, some of the work that we have done uh, to ensure the water quality um, of the pond remains uh, at good status. Uh, two things that, that we're showing here, one is the uh, during the 
summer months uh, biweekly, the APCC uh, is providing, uh, is collecting measurements of cyanobacteria to um, kind of measure in all the ponds in, in Palmas, and we are also doing, you know, these things are also being done for, uh, for Easter Pond, and uh, so far we can say that um, it has been in, in good health, and that's, that's important. Uh, and if, uh, if people want that information, they can go to the, the APCC uh, uh, website and they provide that. Um, so the other thing that we've been trying to do is kind of ensure that we can uh, keep up with um, ensuring that the, quali the water quality of the pond remains uh, good. One of the things that over the years has happened is that we, um, we have been looking at maintaining the salinity levels of the pond at a level that is going to prevent the growth of uh, bacteria and algae that is going to be, you know, the cap potential health risk and all that. So, <clears throat> you know, over the, during many years, um, salinity measure, measurements have been taken and, you know, Mike, you know, has been working hard at that, you know. Um, one thing that we want to do is to provide a little bit more um, kind of continuous data of how the exchange between the ocean and the pond is happening. And in order to do that, we have, um, we requested some money from um, the family fund to install these scorimeters that are, is very simple instrument uh, from lower instruments that basically tilts as the current comes through. Uh, and with that information, we can know how much water is coming from the ocean into the pond or from the pond into the ocean. And that will help us kind of uh, keep a balance of that, um, you know, exchange uh, and kind of do it continuously, which is one thing that, that will allow us to, to be more, you know, proactive if we need to be. As part of our uh, water quality um, focus, you know, we have, uh, you know, the UMass, uh, Sarah Hover from UMass has been uh, collecting um, samples, not since 2106. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> that only kind of need. Uh, so 2016. Uh, and we continue to do this thing. It's important because this thing provides m uh, more in detail information about, you know, what the, uh, the, the real content of uh, nutrients and, and all that is, is in the pond. Uh, and, and they keep sampling these things. Uh, so we have that, you know, those data uh, over the years so that we can keep track of what is happening with the health of the, of the pond. Um, so the, all that was part, so one thing that we have started is to have um, uh, a specific focus groups that one, uh, so subcommittees that focus on, on water quality, on land stewardship, and, um, and, and communications. Um, and the land stewardship has been focusing on uh, doing trail maintenance uh, after storms, for instance, or also, you know, kind of the control of the invasive uh, plants, uh, you know, planning what, what we need to do in the future as well to maintain these things as a base. So we're talking about Japanese knotweed, uh, the bush honey charcoal, phragmitis, poison ivy, you know, all these things that we're trying to keep in, in check. And this last year, uh, we finished with, um, with some of the treatment for the phragmitis that was kind of growing in some of the edges of the pond. Uh, and that's like, you know, after the storm, it was like in Octo end, of end of October last year, it was like a lot of trees down, so we kind of did some work to kind of keep it, keep the trails open and, and all that. Um, do you want to do it? Sure. 
Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Goebel and um, I'm leading our communication subcommittee and the point of the communication subcommittee is to communicate with you. Um, and so these are the ways that we do it. We've um, just started meeting in January and we've been working on learning how to use the website, so we're getting someplace. Um, and then we also communicate with you by having great uh, speakers like we have tonight um, to lure you all here and find out about our little OPED. Back? Oh, wait, who's next? Is it me? No, Treasurer. No. I think I'm Dora, right? Chris? Yeah. All right, and just so you know, the Treasurer's report will be done by a, by a Treasurer, treasurer. Um, but um, he's not here today, so you, know, you have me back. Um, <laughs> so I think financially we're doing pretty well. Um, you know, we keep, um, you know, kind of try to keep a good uh, balance uh, of, of the funds that we have. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, as you can see, you know, in terms of, uh, of income, you know, we, we are uh, kind of covering a lot of the expenses that we have. Um, and, you know, we tend to, like we were talking about with regard to uh, the, the money from the family fund for the instruments that when we when we tackle a, a new project we try to find external sources you know that don't that uh, allow us to kind of keep this um, you know within budget and you also can see the the assets as of as of um, the end of, of June um, so and all these things are available for for, for members to look at. So the idea is that the members will get to vote on approving the, uh, the 2021 treasurer's report uh, and also the, the minutes from the previous annual meeting. And I think that we can do that right now if, uh, if that works. So in order to do that, somebody has to. Second. <laughs> I, I move. You move, exactly. And I'll second. Okay, there you, you move go. that you accept the treasury's yeah. report for 21 to 22. Yes, exactly. Uh, and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you so much. Um, okay, so. Minutes from last year. Oh, minutes from last year, sorry. Alfredo? Yes, please. Hi Good everyone, Jonathan Smith. I'm a, a longtime uh, member of OPEC, uh, and uh, Fred is, uh, you know, he's very flight back. But you know, we we could use everyone's uh, donations. Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think you've got the, uh, most of us have received the summer newsletter. We had a uh, membership form in there. Maybe you're already a member. Maybe you haven't updated yet. I have to mine this year. But if you're looking for any donations, uh, we could use uh, any support. All of you people here tonight can be interested in what's going on in Oyster Pond. And uh, maybe, maybe I'm making a pitch before we're going to make a pitch, but I just say we would love to have you donate to Oyster Pond Environmental Trust. So yeah. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's, you know, it was part of the things that I was supposed to say. And, you know, <laughs> um, so, and there are different ways in which, you know, uh, people can be a, a member and, you know, provide a, an annual contribution. You can make donations. And uh, and the, the money gets used for, you know, maintaining the the pond and the trails and and all these things. So, so that's that I think is important. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, the, minutes to the, minutes. the minutes, yes. So uh, we need to uh, approve uh, the minutes. So uh, somebody has to move to approve the minutes of the previous summer meeting. So move. Uh, somebody seconds. Second. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, um, I also want to thank, you know, a lot the, so, so the op-ed is, is based on, on uh, it has a, a, a board, and the members of the board are volunteers. Uh, and we kind of rotate in and out. Um, uh, after a number of years. So uh, as of right now, we have uh, some outgoing uh, board members uh, and 
you know, I would like for them to stand up so that we can acknowledge them. Um, so we have John Darwin, Mary Golden, <laughs> and, and Dana, who. Thank you so much. And, you know, some members go out, some members are coming in. Uh, so we are uh, welcoming also uh, incoming board members. Some of them are, you know, used to be board members, and some are new. Uh, Steve Layton and, and uh, Olivia Hearn-Smith. Uh, uh, so if, you know, if you are here and you want to stand up so that people know who you are. And again, you know, we are also always looking for people that are interested in being part of the board. Uh, you know, it's, it's, as I said, it's volunteer work. So, you know, um, so it depends on what people's availability is. Uh, but, you know, everybody is welcome that wants to, to be um, kind of helping uh, the, the board. And, yes. Yeah. Actually, as an outgoing board member, I just want to thank the entire board and encourage you, if you're interested in any aspect of this, to, to uh, join the board because it's a great group, very knowledgeable people, both in terms of having been around the area for a long time and then people that have just moved in. Um, Olivia, uh, I'm not sure how many years you've been here, Olivia, but, but basically she's been working at HUI and at MDL and it's just fascinating. I came in not having the oceanography background, but I've learned so much being on the board. Great group. Um, I, I'm glad you're all members of OPED or will be soon. And in the future, I hope you'll consider being on the board as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. OK. So. Hi everyone, I know that you came to hear about Osprey, but we're going to do our river herring report first. Um, so Matt O'Connor led this, he's also our treasurer. He's not here tonight, so I'm doing this for him. Um, so first we're just gonna start off with like, what are river herring? Um, there's two species, there's blueback herring and alewives. Alewives are the lower ones, and they're sort of, um, yes? I'll try. <laughs> okay. Um, so alewives are the lower ones, they're sort of grayish green, and those are the ones that we have here in Oyster Pond. Um, river herring are anadromous species, which means that they spend their, most of their lives at sea, but they come back to rivers to spawn. And um, they come back every four to five years. So, but we have, we have runs every year, they're just different fish coming back each year. Um, there's some facts there, I'm not going to read them to you, but... Um, you can see from these two maps that they have fairly extensive range and they go pretty far out into the ocean. Um, they are a protected species. They are illegal to take, possess, or sell and have been since about 2005. Um, so why are they important? Well, they obviously have a, a, a role in the ecosystem. There used to be millions and millions of them up and down the East Coast, but they have been declining. Um, they're very important for a lot of animals, as you see here. Um, that raccoon there, we caught him stealing fish one by one out of a fish ladder. He just was having himself a little feast. Um, also, whales, dolphins, seals. Um, and they were also long time um, important food and fertilizer for indigenous people. And then when the colonists came, the indigenous people taught colonists how to use the fish both as food and as fertilizer. Um, for the corn, because the corn grew, it yielded three times as much if they used fish for fertilizer. So when the, when the um, herring come back in the spring, that was seen as the sign of the end of winter, and there was a big celebration. Um, so what are the threats to these fish? Why are they not doing well? Well, it's mostly because we've done a good job of damming up the rivers. If you see that um, the map at the top with all the red and green dots, those are all dams, and that's only about half the dams that exist. And the red dams are um, the ones where they think that there would be a high possibility that if they restored fish passage, the fish runs would come back. 
and that was that was a study done by the Nature Conservancy. Um, under here, uh, the middle map is a map of Cape Cod, and the yellow dots are where we're doing, or somebody is doing, restoration projects on those runs. So there's, you can see that there's a lot of work going into restoring herring runs. And over here, you see um, the streams and ponds of western Cape Cod, and seven is us right here, we're a oyster pond. Um, we haven't had an official count until this year. Um, the Mashpee River, is more than number 18 up there. Um, they get more than 100,000 in their run. Uh, number 11, which is Kunanatha River, they get somewhere between 10,000 and 99,000. Uh, number two up there, which is Redbrook, they get about 1,000. And I will reveal later what we get. <laughs> um, so this is our ale life run. Our pond is about 63.5 acres. The stream length is very short. If you've been down there, it's only you know 0.2 miles. It's pretty short, and it's shallow, um, and has required dredging. The the jetties were supposed to help with that, but still sometimes we still have to do dredging or clear out rocks so that the fish can pass. Um, there's a weir constructed in 2000, and that was to reduce the the salinity in the pond but the fish can still get through that little um, notch there, so they go through the weir. And the run usually begins sometime in April when the water reaches about 51 degrees. So why do we count the herring? Um, well, we need population estimates to know um, if they're doing well or if they need more protection. Uh, we need to know if the restoration work we're doing is working or it's not working. And it also builds public support and community awareness of this very important natural resource. Um, so this year was the first year that we actually followed the, the Division of Marine Fisheries guidelines. And so we're now in their database, which is a big step for us. Um, the count went goes from April 1st to May 31st. Um, you do 10 minute counts. So basically you stand at the bridge and watch the fish going under the bridge and you count them as they go. And it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> um, so because our run is mostly a nighttime run, we shifted our time period from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., which is the normal Massachusetts you know, time that you count. Um, they let us change it to 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, so what you would do is you would go down to your 10-minute count, wait 10 minutes, and then do another 10 minute count. And we tried to have one count between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. and another count between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. Uh, we had 12 scheduled volunteers this year and a few ad hoc volunteers as well. And one of the things that um, you will know is if you're a herring counter, you go down and you, you sort of, are, is, are there gonna be any herring? Most of the time there's not any herring. Um, but if you see birds like up there, or you see like a, that little guy sitting out there at the mouth of the river, that means the herring are probably running. Um, so how did it go this year? Uh, well, we had 319 10 minute counts over 61 days, which averages to about five a day. Um, we only saw herring around less than 20% of the times we were down there, so that was a lot of trips down to the river in the freezing cold to see nothing. Um, uh, we saw most of the fish after 7 p.m., uh, only a few, a quarter before 7 p.m., none before noon, they're late risers, um, and only one before 2 p.m. So we counted this year in our, uh, in our 319 counts, 945 herring. Um, and the run they gave us, we turned in all our numbers and they just came back and gave us our run and they think it's around 13,000 plus or minus 5,000. So it's a big variation. <laughs> Could be, you know, anywhere. So I'm gonna just play you a quick video so you can see the fish going up the stream. Um, sometimes they get caught on the side. They flip themselves out. They're usually pretty good at flipping themselves back in, but. You know, if we're there, sometimes we might help, and if we're not there, sometimes the seagull gets a good meal. So, yeah, it's pretty shallow, but they, they are making it up that stream. It seems like it would be pretty hard to count if you had that many. Well, have you ever thought about using video and, and having review of it over So, a lot of streams, um, 
rivers around New England do that, like um, the bigger ones that have more infrastructure. And you can actually go online and help count because they put up the video up and you can you know, count one minute increments or whatever they have for you to count. Um, so yeah, that would be an interesting thing to do. I don't think we're quite that resource rich at the moment. Yeah. iPhone. What? You just use an iPhone. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you can count them and then go back and try to do it. Like try to count, you, you, can, you can tape it and then try to count them like that. The, the trouble you have with that, I did put some cameras in there to try that, is that you end up with about 2,500 uh, eight hour to nine hour pieces that you have to review and it takes about two weeks to do that if you go through it. And so it's much the same frustration that you encounter when you're going there to try and count them shows up with regard to having continual. Right now, there's not an easy way. There may be some way with a laser, but right now there's not an easy way to have the herring trigger the camera. And that's the key that yeah. needs to be done. That would be interesting. Could be a great crowdsourcing project, actually. So yeah. Everybody could have yeah. take, you know, take one minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's what, that's what they do yeah. at, um, like, Mystic River and Town Brook in yeah. Plymouth. They actually do have that in your hand. It is, they have outsourced it. Because they do not have time to go through hours and hours of video. And sometimes the little clips you see, they're like, no, no herring. So you just watch a minute of nothing. <laughs> anyway, um, so we want to say thank you to Lou Turner, who unfortunately passed away in December, but he was the driving force behind this herring count and, and the Kunamuffet River. Um, and so we, he will be missed. He was a great force in this effort, and we appreciate him. Um, these are the names of the 12 counters. And if you'd like to participate in next year's count, um, email Matt O'Connor. His email is there, or you can email any of us at OPET, and we can put you in touch. And I'll pass this along. This evening, and welcome everybody, I'm John Dowling, outgoing member of the Board of Directors. You won't hear from me next year. What we'd like to do this evening first, and just take a few minutes, was to recognize and honor two individuals who have made major contributions to OPET and to Oyster Pond. And our first honoree is Lou Turner, over there on the left. A faithful member of OPET since it was founded back in the 90s and uh, he was on the board of directors for many years. Now you've already just heard that uh, Oyster Pond contributed, contributes significantly to the herring population generated uh, in Falmouth waters. Adults come in in the fall to spawn in the fresh water around the pond. The fry leave the pond in the spring, spend most of their lives in salt water. Lou Turner was the first to say we should be counting these herring, and he started that many years ago. I would guess it would be 10 or 15 years by now that he was counting the uh, uh, herring and doing it by hand. Uh, he, did, he gathered others to join him, and at that point it was all done by counting one by one by one, and he faithfully did it for years and years. Now Lou is no longer with us as you know, but Lee, his wife, is here and what we'd like to do is honor Lou by giving her, uh, in Lou's honor, significant of recognition. Lee, will you come up? It says Thank Certificate you. of Re Recognition. The Oyster Pond Environmental Trust is proud to name the annual Trunk River Herring Count as the Lewis Turner River, Lewis Turner Trunk River Herring Count Encounter, in recognition of Lou's many years of service to OPET and the dedication to the health of Oyster Pond. So, this is something to put on the wall. And 
there is something else that we would like to present to you. A beautiful bowl made by one of our members, one of the incoming members of the Board of Directors, Steve Lake. It's gorgeous. So, Now, the other honoree this evening is almost certainly known by most of you, and that is Wendy Bessler, who served as our executive director for 18 years. Wendy did so much for Opet and the Pond, it is hard to describe all that she accomplished and did. She would go out all through the year taking samples so we could monitor the health of the pond from its salinity and oxygen levels, its nutrients and algal growth, and so forth. She oversaw the removal of invasive species that you've heard something about, particularly Aphragmites and blue, spri blue strife, to be replaced by uh, native plants, and that has happened, particularly along the south end of the pond. And uh, she organized the board of directors meetings, this annual meeting, uh, oversaw the newsletter which you all have received, acknowledged do donations, kept the list of members of the organization, and of course was most critical in our successive quest to obtain the 22 acres headwaters land that we purchased a few years ago to put into conservation. So she not only helped us with that project, but then laid out the trails, had been maintained them, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, Wendy could not be here this evening, uh, but uh, we thought it important to recognize her here tonight and her marvelous contributions uh, with a certificate and, uh -huh, and also a bowl, again made by Mr. Layton, Dr. Layton, I should say. Certificate of Recognition, the Oyster Pond Environmental Trust is proud to recognize Wendy Bessler for her many years of exceptional service to OPIT and her dedication to the health and habitats of Oyster Pond. And it is signed by Alfredo, our president. Now, we're planning another event to honor uh, Wendy when this pandemic is finally over. And we will make these presentations to her at that time. And there's, again, another surprise. And we hope to see you, some of you anyway at that other time that we honor Wendy. So, okay, I'll turn it back now. Again, a beautiful bowl sitting in that box. Okay, so I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our two speakers this evening, Kevin Beal and Barbara Schneider. Um, I met Kevin about a year and a half ago when I was looking for a rare bird. He and I are both birders, um, obsessed birders. <laughs> uh, we were looking for a rare bird in Sagamore, and there was a lot of birders there, no bird. Kevin shows up, bird appears like that. <laughs> um, yeah, he is a fantastic photographer and naturalist. Um, he and Barbara um, started this project about a year ago, about a year ago? Um, a little over a year ago. A little over a year ago. Um, as you may know, ospreys took a steep decline um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, fortunately, they are now recovering very well, um, but they have this ongoing issue that they like to nest on power poles because wherever is the highest point, that's where they want to be. And I'm not going to give too much away. Um, we know that this is an issue around town, and Kevin and Barbara have been working very hard over the last year and a half to try to resolve this issue. So um, thank you for coming. And just give me two seconds here to switch to their presentation. There you go. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Oops. Trip, on. trip and fall before you even start. <laughs> so I'm Kevin Friel, and this is Barbara Schneier, and together we are the Osprey Project, along with um, some other people. I don't see Mark Kasperzik here, but I need to make a point that he was vital 
to this all happening. Um, he was kind of our liaison between us and the town um, and all of the environmental aspects that we had to deal with. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll get into it then, huh? I think so. So I think the first thing we wanted to do was ask for a few of you to raise your hand and offer a fact about Osprey that you think you know. Uh, I can't, no way, no way I'll ask it over there. <laughs> They've been coached. Yes. They fish effectively in Oyster Pond. They yeah. very Not much Not so do. much the herring, but the white perch. Yep. yep, okay, that's a good one. I read somewhere, but I don't know if it's true, that after they catch a fish, they somehow flip them around to be more aerodynamically. They do. Fish they head, head yep. first. They yep. will always carry the fish yep. head first. And there's a, there's a reason for that that we'll get into a little bit later. They're, they're different than other birds, and I'll explain that very, very soon, actually. Yep. Yeah, the other thing, about 20 years ago, we built our own osprey nest. Uh, uh, near Lou Turner's house, and it was not occupied immediately by the Osprey. It took over five years before we finally did have it occupied. So they don't always come to a nest. Which we don't. That's right. They they don't um, they don't come to a nest just because you put it there. They um, they are very specific about their nesting needs, the type of structures they're looking for, mainly the exits and entrance from that nest. So if you have something out to the southwest of that nest that may be kind of bothering them, they're not super likely to use it. There's one at Fuller Field that will, the world will be engulfed by the sun before that osprey nest gets used <laughs> because there is something directly to its southwest that's taller than it. So they have an obstacle there. And they do that because of the prevailing winds here. So they need an entrance from the northeast and an exit to the southwest. So we, we took a lot of that into account when we were planning for our project, um, for the placement of all of our platforms. Um, we'll get into a little bit of the specifics of that once we talk about the different types of, types of platforms we used and stuff. The other thing that we could throw out to you is that who knows what the lifespan of Osprey usually is. So 15 to 20 years. And anyone have an idea of what the oldest known osprey was? 25 years. And in that lifetime, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, traveling that they do. And you all know that they leave here and they return. And that's been a big thing for all of us to watch. But their migratory uh, patterns take them incredible numbers of miles. And I'll let Kevin tell you a little bit about that. And we'd like to talk about one particular osprey named Bell that um, tra racked up a lot of miles. Yep. So Bell back in 2008 was tagged on Martha's Vineyard. Um, they have a satellite receiver on, on his back. They thought it was a female when they tagged it. <laughs> Turns out it's not. So, so Bell the boy, as he flew from Martha's Vineyard to French Guiana, and it took him 13 days. Um, now, this map here shows the osprey. If you can see the purple area kind of down in the middle in Florida and Baja, California, those are our stationary osprey. Those ones will live year-round and not migrate at all. The other ones, the, the dark brown up in Canada and along our coastline, move down to the blue areas in South America. Now, there are no, no breeding osprey at all in South America. They do all of their breeding in the northern hemisphere for some reason. The ones from Europe go to Africa, but they don't breed. The ones from China and Japan go down into um, Indonesia, Fiji, Australia, um, and they don't breed, but there are some year round in Australia as well. And uh, there's one nest in particular in Australia that has been documented to have osprey living in it for 80 consecutive years. So they're a very, very uh, close knit family group of birds that there's some, kind of some science saying that they're eventually the nest that a baby was born in 
eventually the timing may be right that the parents no longer return when that baby makes its first trip back up and then they will take over that nest. In the spring you'll notice a lot of them, there's a lot of warfare going on in the skies in the spring. And a lot of that is juvenile birds who are being pushed out by their parents because they come back to the nest they were, they were born in and they want to live there. They want to they want to raise their own kids now that they're sexually mature. Um, and they don't come back. This is one of the questions we get all the yeah. time. When do they come back? Do, they, do the young ones really go down south and come back right away? No. And sometimes it's three years. Yeah, three to five years to reach sexual maturity. And they will not come back up here until they're ready to breed. So they'll, a, lot of, a lot of the raptors do that, the snowy owls in particular. They, they will migrate south and then hang out for two or three years on the wintering grounds. And then once they reach maturity, then they go back up north and do their thing, make more snowy owls. And I know it was mentioned that um, osprey were in trouble during the 70s. They were certainly in trouble actually from the 50s to the 70s because that was when DDT was being used. The eggshells were so thin and they were crushing their own eggs. Um, but an interesting fact that from Boston to New York, just along that stretch of coast, in that time frame, 90% of the breeding pairs were wiped out, if you think of that. 90% just from New York to Boston. Yep. We ended up with six breeding pairs on all of Cape Cod. So what did, what did the government do, Migratory yep. Bird Treaty Act? in 1918 is something that has been used to protect these birds. And it is one of the reasons that we can actually say to somebody, you can't just let those birds get killed. You can't keep them in harm's way when you know they are in harm's way. Um, and, there, and so that's been important to us and it should be important to all of us to remember that one act. Yeah, a the Migratory bit. Board Treaty Act is, was a very good thing. It, it has some, we'll call them idiosyncrasies, yeah. where like you could, you could in theory be arrested for picking up a feather. If you find a feather on the ground, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 says that you can't have that. And, and that was actually started because of what? Who knows why they started that Hats. about the feather? Hats. Hats, exactly. Hats were wiping out. Um, a yeah. lot of birds. So that's why the feather is part of this. And Thornton Burgess, some of you may know of his children's books. He's, um, there's a museum for Thornton Burgess over in Sandwich. He was instrumental in passing this. So it's, it's nice to have kind of a local yeah. tie to that as well. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's get into some bird stuff here. Yep. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a typical osprey, osprey attack posture, uh, about a foot from the surface of the water. And first time I get to say this word in public, the zygodactyl foot. So <laughs> this right here, if you look at this, you can see it forms a, a very good X. Most birds, other than owls, have three in the front, one in the back, and they're stuck with it. Osprey and owls can have three in the front, one in the back, and then decide, you know what, I need two and two. So they can swing a digit around and form that X. And this is just phenomenal at catching fish. Absolutely insane at catching fish, as you can see here. Now, another thing about their claws, um, they're shaped differently than other raptors. They're much more, um, there's much more curve to them. They're smoother on the top side. And then the underside, they have scales that go back the other direction. So when they grab onto something, those scales lock in. And it's very difficult to get out of the grasp of an osprey. I actually had one, we rescued an osprey last week and he, uh, he grabbed a hold of my finger pretty good. I still have the marks from that to prove it. <laughs> but they are unbelievably sharp. Um, mm -hmm. like just, it's like a hypodermic needle that's this long and opens up to about a half an inch at the, the top half of it. One of the things that I'll add in this picture, they can actually go down as deep as three feet. Yeah. That's not usual. What yeah. you normally see is this, where they're grabbing it off the top, but they can go down that far. And one of the things that allows them to do that is they have much oil, more oily feathers than other birds. So the water kind of just rushes right off of it. 
Another thing that the, bird, the osprey can do that's quite unique is they can close their nostrils. Not many birds can do this. So when they hit the water, all sorts of things happen. The, nic the nictating membrane goes back, the nostrils close. They, and they have adjusted in their mind when they're hovering, they do this kind of hovering thing where they're 30, 40 feet and they just do this. And when they see a fish, their brain can tell them, all right, well, this is the angle that I have attacking and this is how deep the fish is. So the fish isn't there, it's really here. So they, they can deal with the refracted light and hit a spot the size of a quarter. I have seen osprey come up, they go hit the water and come up with a fish in each hand. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. They are um, able to, the average length of time for an osprey to be looking for a fish before that bird has a fish, 12 minutes, all you fishermen, 12 yeah. minutes. 12 minutes. And the other thing to remember is they are successful one out of every four dives. And some of the some of the more mature uh, birds that have had lots of practice, they've documented them being successful up to seventy percent of the time, which is astonishing. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't catch anything seventy percent. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. You get colds. Well, that's that's true. <laughs> so now we'll talk about this the position of this fish. Yeah. Um, you notice it. It always is the head forward tail backwards, and this makes it more streamlined, but it also, these fish are still alive for 20 minutes until their heads are literally ripped off. So <laughs> these birds, sometimes you'll see them carrying a fish and the fish is flopping, and they're able to hold that fish steady so it doesn't disturb their flight. Show them the next one, because that shows that position yep. really And this one shows it really well. <laughs> and it shows how sharp those talons are. They just very easily just boom right through it. And I think that the, a lot of times you're wondering how big are the fish when you're watching them carry fish, you know? So the average, um, average size is about one-third to two-thirds pounds, but they have been known to carry as heavy as two-and-a-half pound fish. Yeah. You know what's about a pound and about a third to two-thirds of a pound? Alewife. Mm -hmm. these, these birds follow the alewife. When they, make, and then when they come up to make their initial uh, spawn and run into the rivers, these birds are there. It happens right around um, St. Patrick's Day. Um, it's usually this year on the 19th, there were no birds here. And on the 20th, more than half of them have come back, which is remarkable because they come, when they migrate, the males and the females go different places. So we said that Bell went to French Guiana. The Bell's mate may have gone to Nicaragua or may have gone to Chile or Venezuela, anywhere down into Argentina. And then they'll come back and they meet within days. Sometimes it's the same day they'll show back up at the nest after a 2,000 mile voyage. They somehow, they, they show up at the same time. And it all revolves around the Aloy. And the best thing that Kevin and I laugh about is that if the female gets back first, she will sit there and she will be damned if she's going to go get a stick and start working on that <laughs> building. Yep. Yeah, the males do all the heavy lifting. The females pretty much, if you, if you have a couple of hours to kill next spring when they're in their, their nest building phase, just hang out and watch a nest. And you'll see that the female sits on the nest and the male will come in and drop a stick. And then he'll take off and go get another stick. While he's gone, she'll fiddle with the stick with her, her beak and put it into place. So it's kind of a joint thing. They're both building, but only the male is really carrying stuff. And then they're both responsible for their own food until the eggs are born. And then the males do a lot of the heavy lifting for the females. They do most of the hunting. Um, Males are a little bit smaller birds than the females, so they tend to be just a touch more agile, which in my mind would lead to them having a slightly higher success rate hunting. There's absolutely no scientific proof of that. It's just a theory that I have. Um, probably wrong about that, but we'll see. <laughs> so this is an interesting picture here. I just, I thought it was beautiful the way that you could see his beak right here in his 
to shadow with his mouth with it wide open. Now this picture was taken along the Kunamesset River restoration, which two years ago was amazing for Osprey. Two to three years ago was amazing. This past year, there was almost no predation from Osprey along that stretch of the Kunamesset River. And that's all because of the restoration of that river. Before, there were a lot of sandy areas that were very exposed when these fish came over. So with all of the restoration work that they've done, a lot of the natural grasses have come back in that river. Um, and it's a spring-fed river, so those grasses are able to thrive a lot longer into the year. So it hides these herring very well from these osprey. So now they're going further up the Kunamesset River, um, which, the, what is it, the Barboza property? Yes. So they, they hunt basically behind the cranberry bogs on Thomas Landry's Road. Mm -hmm. And they can actually have um, their food source anywhere within 12 miles of where their nest is. Okay. Yeah, so you may see, we've, Bell, was a, Bell was a kind of an interesting bird because we got to see how far these birds are going to travel from their local nest. Bell um, was living on a utility pole along um, McCallum Drive in Woods Hole, right behind Peterson's farm. Yeah. Uh, she's no longer, he's no longer there. We're, we kind of lost track of Bell. Um, we'll explain a little bit about that later okay. once we talk about the position of that stuff. But Bell, Bell was seen over by Old Silver Beach. Bell was also seen in East Falmouth. Yeah. So, and there's only one bird that had a satellite tracker on its back, so it was easy to pick it out. So they have a, a pretty wide area. Um, this is what I call the Cape Cod snow cone. This is typically what you see when an osprey is feeding. Um, they will, the males tend to be pretty funny about giving the females food. So they'll come back with a, a fish and they'll sit in a tree for 20 minutes and eat what they want. The female will sit there screaming at them and they're just, oh yeah, 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 you get it. And then they deliver the Cape Cod snow cone to the female, which is like the second half of the fish. I don't know if the head just gets tossed and they eat the innards, I really don't know. Um, I haven't really seen them eating the heads, but I've seen a lot of fish without heads on them. Right. So I have, a, I have a suspicion they just cut the heads off and then right. reach in and eat. And we have found head remains in the nests. Yes. We've also found um, rabbit feet in the nests. We've found squirrel tails in nests. And we have, um, what was the other thing that we saw? Well, we chipmunks. We had the rabbit head fall out of the nest right while we were picking it up. Yeah, it's it's not for the faint of heart some yeah. days. <laughs> so they say that 99% of their diet consists of fish, and specifically saltwater fish. They they tend to eat, or they tend to prefer saltwater over freshwater. I'm not sure why, but they would rather eat a striped bass than a largemouth bass. Um, we'll see them flying with black sea bass fluke, flounder, tatog, menhaden, they will eat anything that's a fish and very few things that aren't. And that's also where they get their water, so it's coming right out of the fish itself, although they have been known to actually land on the edge of a pond and drink. And we've seen that certainly with our osprey that live on Green Pond, where you'll see them just literally bending over and taking a drink, but it's not usual. And a little bit about the physiology of these birds. They all have a very white, stark underside, and they're very dark on their backs. Um, it tends to, I don't know if it really camouflages them while they're flying, because I would imagine that fish can see pretty well as well. So they, they can see these birds, and if they're bright white, it makes it a lot harder for the fish to see. So they kind of blend into the sky that way. Um, this one here uh, appears to be a female. If you look at the, the chest area, they, this one has what's called a necklace. Um, it's very difficult to tell in an individual bird. If you see a pair of birds sitting next to each other in a nest, instantly you can say, okay, that one has a necklace, that one doesn't. When you see one just sitting by itself, sometimes that, a little bit of that necklace shows up. And that's how Belle ended up being named Belle, because it had a very heavy necklace. They thought it was a female. Turns out, not at all. Uh, a little bit more about the physiology of these birds. If you notice the dark patch out 
they, they call that the wrist um, before the long feathers. They all extend out of that wrist. The osprey have a very mobile wrist. So you'll see them flying in the sky. It almost looks like a W or an upside down M. Um, very, very unique posture in the air. Very unlike eagles and things that tend to soar more. Um, the osprey don't do much soaring. They're a little bit thinner, less lift on their wings. So they require to beat their wings quite more frequently than even the red-tailed hawks with the big, fat, wide wings. Uh, they, can, they can hold a spot in the sky. The osprey have a, a lot of trouble doing that. But and we then, have watched them practice thermals really well. Yep. Yeah, they they're can, good at thermals. They can do that. Um, let's see. It's molting. So molting. Every year they're, they're going to molt. Right now, the juveniles, well, they, they won't molt till they get south. But um, every year they're going to lose every single feather on their body. This bird right here did not do that. If you notice the coloring on this bird, it has a lot of really white or lighter tan patches on it. And this is a bird that um, it skipped the molt. So the, the feathers are a year to a year and a half old. So they're very, very um, sun, sun bleached and damaged feathers. This bird did eventually end up midway through the summer. You never even knew that it skipped the molt. But they think, I talked to a few people, and they believe that it was some environmental aspect in South America that caused this. You've seen juveniles right now that look like they have scales. So all the juveniles tend to have that little white edge so that there's a pattern like scales until they are, um, have gone completely dark. So we find all kinds of nesting materials in these nests. <laughs> these guys here figured the zygodactyl feet weren't enough, so they threw a fishing pole in the mix. Um, the good news is there was no line, so we, we just left that there. And they actually positioned that that way. Just yep. imagine that. Yeah, that wasn't placed by anybody except that, that silly bird. I wish I would have seen that. <laughs> yep. um, this particular nest is over on Bay Shores Drive. This We'll show you another picture of this one later on. But um, Eversource actually helped with one of these juveniles that fell out of the nest this spring. So Eversource stepped up and put the juvenile back in the nest for us, which was great. They actually provided this platform as well because it's on one of their dead poles. Um, we'll show you, once we get to the, that section, we'll show you a little bit more. We have a nest right off of our property, and we had a series of years where they every year decorated with either something plastic, caution tape, CVS bag. You'd always see something billowing and very decorative. Now, in the last number of years, they've started to go green, and they always have a little tree or some kind of planting coming up out of it. It's the most amazing. How, how yeah, there's, a, there's a great plant being grown uh, by the, the osprey over on Salt Pond. There's a very short platform yeah. that's, if you're driving along Salt uh, Surf Drive towards Woods Hole, yes. on the right there's a short platform there. I don't know if it's a hydrangea they're growing. I don't know what it is. <laughs> they've got quite a plant going. Gardeners. Yeah. So this picture here demonstrates the, uh, if we look at these two birds, notice the bottom bird is I mean, a little bit of it is the depth perception. This is a bigger bird. The one on top is smaller. And you can see where if this bird were by itself, you'd think, oh, that has a necklace. But if you see it with this one, you say, oh, no, it doesn't, compared to the other bird. So we know that this is the female, and that's the male from the nest. These ones live over on uh, Whistler's Way in Wacoit, out by the Wacoit Congregational Church. We actually, um, we topped a a white pine tree and put a, a platform in there about 30 feet from the telephone pole they were living in. Uh, the, the bird on the left is a very stark white example of a male. There's no confusing that one for a female. So you know that if it has an all white chest, you're a male. If it has an, a brown in there somewhere, you don't know what it is. <laughs> but you know that if it has an all white chest, it's going to be a male. It's not really a field mark that they use. I mean, we use it a lot when you're studying the pairs of birds, but in all the field guides and everything, they really don't even mention the necklace because it's not a reliable thing if you see one bird. 
So the mating and the egg laying and all that good stuff. So there's basically a two week stretch where every time the male comes back to the nest, they try and make babies. Uh, sometimes she's not having it, sometimes, sometimes obviously she does, or they wouldn't be here. Um, and they'll, she'll lay an egg, the first egg will be laid, three to five days later she'll lay another egg, three to five days later she might lay another egg, and then there's an extreme circumstance where they may have as many as four eggs. Now they lay them three to five days apart, so by the time you get to that fourth egg, you're about two weeks behind. Um, they incubate for between 36 and 42 days. So if that first egg hatches after 36 days, that fourth egg literally has halfway to go. So there, you've got a bird that's being fed constantly while the other ones are still incubating. Once they hatch, they're at a severe disadvantage. So generally, the osprey will fledge two nests two uh, chicks from a nest. Um, occasionally we see three, rarely we see four, although the past three years I have found nests in Falmouth with four of them. That, make, are, that make it. That, yeah, four of them that fledge. That make it. Now of those four that fledge, we probably won't see any of them ever again. Um, raptors get a really hard way of life. About 80% of all raptors, osprey, Owls, red-tailed hawks, bald eagles, about 80% of them do not see their first birthday. And of that 80%, about 10%, or of the 20% what, the that's remaining, about 10% of them will, will reach sexual maturity. And then of that 10%, 10% of them will actually um, make enough babies to replace themselves. So it takes quite a lot for these birds to really progress their population and numbers. So we've done a great job since the 1980s to have them rebound like they have. It's been quite remarkable. And when you're seeing those two birds come back to a platform, you know that that's unusual. I mean, it is amazing that they've made it. Yeah, and they, they are, for the most part, we call them monogamous. Um, but I'll tell you what, if, it, if one bird gets killed, the other one will find a mate five minutes later. They do not mess around. Um, we, we had some incidents uh, last year. A bird got electrocuted over by cappies. Um, it was a male bird, which if the female bird gets electrocuted, a lot of times that nest will cease to exist anymore. Um, if it's a male bird, the female will stay by the nest, and then another male will bring it fish. And she'll say, okay, you'll do. <laughs> and, now, and now they're they're partners forever. Now here's a good example of the feathers that Barbara was talking about. Now these this is a juvenile osprey. If you notice, his eye is more orange than it is yellow. If we go back to an adult bird, oops. Well, it's not a great. Yeah, this one down here. If we look down here, that that eyeball is bright yellow. Mm -hmm. um, we look at this one, it's got more of an orange tone to it. Now this is after about a month. This one's getting close to being ready to fledge. Um, if you look at the feathers, you notice the white edge, and it's, it's kind of an un unkept look to it. The, the feathers don't zip together like most feathers do. And that does a couple of things. The main thing that it does is it allows the birds to trap more air when they flap their wings. So it, it's basically like training wheels on a bicycle. So they, they get a little bit more loft. It's easier for them to fly. Now the downside to that is it inhibits their mobility quite a bit. The turning and banking and diving and doing all the stuff that they do really doesn't happen as well with these feathers. But once they shed these after the first year, now they've got their adult feathers. Now they learn how to fly. It's kind of like a, a B-1 bomber versus a F-16. <laughs> where they, they're slow and lunky, and then all of a sudden, okay, now I, now I get it. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So this is a um, female feeding a, a juvenile. You can see the difference in the eyes there. This is over at Magansett Beach. Uh, again, just fish. 
Now, once the birds have decided to fledge, the males will run kind of a secondary school of teaching how to build nests. We're not 100% sure that they're teaching the babies how to do it, but the males will go get sticks and bring them back to the nests. And then a few days later, the juveniles start going and getting sticks and bring them back to the nest. So you can put two and two together and figure there's something going on there. And again, they, they do the primary nest building in the spring. And then in the fall, they do like a secondary building. Um, right now, we've got an issue um, over by Clinton Ave. Some of you may have seen the, the platform that we put on Clinton Avenue. Um, one of the juveniles from that nest has decided that he likes the telephone pole over on Brown Court. So he's over there. So we'll get every source on that. So this is the part where we now explain how we ever came to this Osprey project. And when I first uh, contacted Kevin, it was because he was really upset about an incident with one of the birds um, that had been in trouble because of this building in an inappropriate place. And I reached out to him and said, you know, I've dealt with Eversource and you can't just stomp your feet and cry and be mad at Eversource. We've got to find a way to figure this out. And after not long, we were meeting on a regular basis with um, one of the members of the CONCOM staff who was very helpful in guiding us in what permitting would look like and what it would take for projects that were, for example, like the ones on Thomas Landers Road where we actually had to have Commonwealth of Massachusetts permits to put up those poles. And um, we started to talk about how we would have to not be counting on Eversource to solve this, but rather for us to solve it ourselves in the town of Falmouth. And that's when we decided to take a look around, as you will see in the next few pictures, at the different places that we had trouble. And Kevin um, had a really good handle already on most of the nests in this town. And he knew where the trouble nests were, for the most part. A little more fine tuning on that. And we were able to identify between 20 and 25 nests that we knew had to be changed and we needed to do it between the time we were talking and March 17th. And we needed to find the money to do it, and we needed to have a design of what we were going to offer to them as an alternative housing. So if they stayed there, what would be the problem? Well, we'll, 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 we'll get to that in uh, about three slides. Mm -hmm. So this. Um, this is a nest that Eversource removed, and if you look here, you can see the raptor guards. That's these plastic pipes. These are a raptor guard that Eversource tries to employ to keep the birds off of the poles. Obviously, it doesn't work. <laughs> and uh, please also know one of the things Eversource does do is they'll go around and they'll knock the nests off in the early stages or come September, okay? So you will see nests being removed. And that's when we started to realize there was really an issue going on because it's not so much these nests that are the problem as much as the rebuilding of them that is. Right, like the, both this nest over here on the right, it looks like a complete mess. That nest is probably five or six years old. So it's relatively stable. Wherever the wires go through that nest, there's been enough smoldering and centering of those sticks that they don't make contact. So it's really not as big a problem as it looks. The problem is when Eversource came in every spring and removed those nests and didn't do anything about it, they didn't place deterrence up top, these birds came in and now they're dropping fresh sticks all over them. And um, two years ago, I believe we had somewhere between nine and 11 we have, yeah, 10, fires. 10 and then one. That just subsequent. straight up, these nests burned. Mm -hmm. And that was, it and that, cow, that was power outages along yep. with that too. So keep yeah, that three mind. of them were just at uh, at Cappy's. Mm -hmm. So these are the, another example of the Raptor guards and how effective they are. <laughs> they, they pretty much just provide an, an area for these birds to Nestle. stabilize a nest. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how they thought that would work. I'm being honest. 
Oh, should have warned you. Hold yeah, on a that's second. Go back. This, this, this next, will keep, cover your this eyes. This next image this is, is, not is nice. representative of the problem. Um, yeah. This um, this was taken in distance. I kept it at a distance. Uh, this osprey. If you notice this this PVC pipe that's up above the bird, that is another form of deterrent that Eversource is trying to use that we find obviously very ineffective. This nest was removed by Eversource. They put up this uh, thing. We call it a T-bar. Um, and two days later, we have a dead offspring with an egg, yeah. which is, and this is the problem. It's the fires and it's the dead birds. This was a male bird, so the female kept right on going. So this is um, a, an anecdote I'm going to share with you. This is the tea ticket school. And for those of you who follow what we're doing in the town, you know that one of the things that we had in place for this year was to put a new roof on the tea ticket school. And one of the things that the um, law would say is that once there's an active nest of one of these birds, you can't disturb them, you can't harass them. So there would be no no new roof if this, in fact, had continued. So um, one of the things that we started to do right away was to think of how we were going to get these off of the chimney quickly before there were any eggs and how we could get a new platform up, which is exactly what we did. Um, on, however, they were extremely persistent. Um, Easter Sunday, my husband and I spent the day over at the school with a person from our DPW who was willing to give up his holiday and actually come over with a bucket. And we had a war with these two birds. And they were literally, he would go up in the bucket, the birds would be staring at him and just not going to move. And then finally, at the last second, they'd move. And he'd put up some cones. And then they would go back, and they'd have nestled between the cones. It just went on and on. And we were getting really nervous that we weren't going to be successful. But finally, finally, we did put up a whole bunch of these crazy things curving and waving in the wind. And they moved. And they actually moved to the new platform that we put on the school property within view of this chimney. So that was a huge success with a lot of help, I will say, from the DPW yes. and the school. And um, Moriarty Tree. And, and Moriarty, Moriarty Tree came in yeah. and did it as well. So I'd like to get back to deterrence real quick. This, this one on the bottom right here, we call this the barrel deterrent. There is not one single osprey nest built on a barrel deterrent that I have found anywhere in the world. But if you look to the, the left of that, that is the same, the same pole. Yeah. That's with the raptor guards, and then this is two days later with the black. We finally talked Eversource into getting rid of those raptor guards. So two years ago, um, after the fires and the three outages and the six blown transformers at the Christmas tree shop, I was able to talk Eversource into raising a platform behind Cappies. Um, and they moved right to it after they put this black to turn up. Which is, which is great. Here's another example of um, a, a situation where this T-bar was put in so tall that this, it didn't even phase these birds. They just built right on it. If yep. you notice, there's a bird in the lower left there. That's on a telephone pole that's set back from this pole. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Eversource put a platform up on top of one of their poles. That's this pole. We've got a picture of what this turned into later. And then these are some of the other places that they're nesting that aren't really a problem. Um, I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's not a, a public nuisance problem. Um, it's not healthy for the birds to be next, this close to the, the antennas on these radio towers. Or the ones on the left there are living in the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> the problem with the Walmart parking lot birds is they, they're not born knowing how to fly. And a lot of times, the osprey's first flight ends up on the ground. So with that being said, um, birds sitting in an empty parking space, somebody's not paying attention. So that's what's happened to all of the birds for the last couple of years from Walmart. Um, 
that's another thing that we're going to try to figure out. I don't know how to fix that. Um, and here's our mess we made on the two ticket school. Yeah. You can, again, you can see that really worked and that beautifully. Didn't even, that nope. didn't even work. Nope. They're just, they were so angry at us. They were crazy. Yep. Yeah. This was on Easter. <laughs> yep. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. This is, I want you to know that he put those cones up before he had lowered his bucket down. They were sitting on those <laughs> They are resilient birds. They are, um, yep. I call them maniacal. They yeah. just, yeah. They, if they want to live where they want to live, and there's nothing you can say about it. Yeah. That's my chimney. Okay. So now going back to the utility poles, um, I'll let Barbara talk about the approach we use. We, we really were careful to have a business plan, to be honest. And we um, started, as I told you, with the Kevin and Mark identifying all the nests that were on these poles that were trouble. And we knew that they had to have deterrence to keep the new nests if we were going to offer them anything else to live on. Um, I, we were, the big thing was to identify if there was an alternative site, and then if that site was going to be approved by the town or by the state or wherever it was. And that was all part of this large plan. So we were very grateful to CONCOM and the help they gave us on this. And then of course, there's always the money part. And so I kind of broke off from Kevin busying, he and Mark busying with the permitting part and the design of where things were going. And I started to raise funds. And this town, I'll tell you one thing between my, my dog park work and this osprey work, this town supports animals like there's no tomorrow. It was amazing how wonderful everybody was in wanting to be part of this. And some people, I've got people that are still giving me $10 a month toward this. I mean, that's just how it is. And they care so much, so many little notes came in about what the birds mean to them and how it signals their summer and it ends their summer. So anyway, that's what we were able to do. We, were, we have money set aside at this point that we will be maintaining these and we still have some to fix. And in, that's where the rest of the money is going to be used. Okay. So. Um, we'll get into some of the designs. Well, actually, talk about following together. We can. This quickly. is if you don't know this group. Well, we are so lucky to have this group in our town. It is a 501c3 that was started specifically to be able to give the after prom to kids and collect money and have it be a charitable donation. But they have taken on all these little charities, including the dog park, when it first was trying to get off the ground. They put them under their big umbrella so that you can collect donations under that charitable um, label. And they help, all, they do the paperwork, they issue checks, they keep very careful records and they do the taxes. It's a phenomenal thing and we should all be very grateful for them. And I just wanted to add that. So you can see we did get a number of wonderful grants and a lot, we had people that sponsored an entire poll. Um, we were very lucky. I'll talk more specifically about a couple of the poles later. Um, actually, here it is right here. If you look at this pole on the right, that LAMF, it's the uh, Leanne Manillo Foundation. She died uh, during childbirth of twins a few years ago. And this foundation was set up to help other families that were going through a tragedy like that. Uh, if you notice the names on it, we got Dan and Nick. Those are her sons. They helped build that platform. So that was a pretty neat thing. We did a lot of that. We had, um, well, we'll talk about that one in just a minute. But the, uh, we used three designs for our poles. One of them is this. This was kind of our standard swamp design. Um, <laughs> anything that was going in a salt marsh or somewhere <coughs> where there wasn't a lot around it, we were able to utilize one of these. And we could use manpower to put these up, which is what was so great about that. And we hand dug those holes yeah. to be very careful about the environment yeah. and so on. Yeah, I mean, in the picture, you can see that we, we had, um, 
I mean, there was nothing destroyed around this in order to do it. We, we had to dig a little right. hole and set anchors. We were actually even, if we were drilling a hole, we were actually collecting the, the drill drip parts that were coming out from the wood, the little, you know, it was unbelievable how careful we were. So that's one of our styles of holes. And on the left here is the pine tree that we took the top off of. This was a tree that was nine tenths dead and ready to fall over. Um, it was lucky that we had a tree like this so close to a power pole that had a nest on top. Um, when we set this platform on top, it was about 20 minutes before the birds yep. started dropping sticks on it. Yeah, they did. Um, this nest over to the right, that is the Clinton Avenue nest. That is a, we had to purchase standard telephone poles. We purchased 35 foot poles. Um, <laughs> just because we weren't sure exactly what sizes we were gonna need. We ended up cutting this one to 21 feet, placing the, the platform itself at 18 feet off the ground. That we could not do with manpower. So we needed a crane in order to bring <coughs> And we home. were very grateful for DPW to store those while we were, as we were doing the project. And here are all of our platforms. Um, the guys over at Miller Starbuck Construction volunteered to accept our, our lumber order. And we gave them their designs for our platform. They cut up all the pieces. And then we distributed each one of these kits, we called them, to a volunteer. Um, you know, Van and Nick put one of these together. I put one together. Um, there's several people. Some, Lenny Armstrong, some, I saw. Yep, are here. Um, yep. yep, there's right Lenny. Thank you very much, Lenny. Yep. So we have, we've got a lot, of, um, a lot of involvement from the community in this. And, Almost everybody signed their platforms, which is kind of a neat thing. <laughs> so they, can, they were told where their platform that they made ended up, so they can go see their birds whenever they want. A um, few of the nests, a few of the platforms were built by uh, a Boy Scout troop. There was actually one nest that fell outside of the parameters of our Osprey project. We really only wanted to deal with the utility poles. There was a, a nest over on Quaker Road by Old Silver that had fallen about four years ago, and the, the pole was just laying in the marsh, obviously not occupied. And we figured that you know, the Boy Scouts were looking for something to do, so we asked them to if, use our design, would raise a platform there. Um, about six days after it was raised, it was inhabited. So it was, Pretty neat. They're, the birds were quick to react to a lot of our platforms. And if you would have told me that I would be going and meeting a truck with that delivery <laughs> ever in my life <laughs> and figuring out how I was going to get those offloaded, yep. no, I, I didn't those believe it. Poles. Yep. And there I am uh, chilling in one of the nests over on the right there. That shows how big these things are. They're 48 by 48, yeah. which is quite large. It's a little bit bigger than some of the other platforms that have been put up around town. Um, they, they were made with pressure treated materials so that they don't rot. One of the problems that we're having with a lot of the platforms around town and something that our project is going to have to deal with is um, these platforms that were made with just pallets. That became a craze. People would put these pallets on top of a pole and five, six years later the pallet falls apart. Yeah. And now you're left with a collapsed nest and a pole that they can't work with. So this is one of, our, one of our nests. This was over along the Childs River. Um, this is the old Wakoit Highway. Maria Hickey Landscaping um, volunteered to help us set a few of the smaller telephone poles. This one was another 18-foot pole. Uh, we hid this one in a tree line, which science tells you that osprey won't live on a tree line. They will if there's an exit to the southwest and an entrance from the northeast. And they did. And they did. These birds yep. are still here. You can see in the, in the back, that's the pole they were on. You can see that one as you're driving over the, the Childs River Bridge in Wacoit on the right-hand side, just past Boson's Marine. Now you can't see their nest. I beg you to go try and find yep. it. You find it in that tree line. Now this is a, actually, I forgot this was a video. So we'll let this run just a little bit. And this shows kind of how this went up and how heavy and daunting of a thing this really was. Yeah, that trying to lift just that platform alone, much less with the telephone pole, is incredible. 
but this is what we did. Marie Hickey's the same person who just redid the road race garden at Falmouth Heights. If you haven't noticed it, please do. It's a fabulous job. And her men were incredibly helpful on this project. Yes, me down on the ground, try not to get my fingers crushed. <laughs> How deep is the hole? Now, six, we did yep, six feet on those. We did six feet. So this is going nowhere. The ones that were in the swamps, those were three to four feet. Three and to four. they were hand dug. These we did. Um, this one was actually well, that was hand, hand dug. dug too, yeah. yeah. This was us more. with post hole diggers. We had to open the hole up so that it was wide enough that we could open the post hole diggers. So we had to shelf it. So yeah. we had to dig about this big around about that deep. Yeah. And then we went the full six feet, um, big enough, 18 inches, I believe, mm -hmm. which was pretty crazy. Okay. And then this is just the other, this is when the crane got involved. This is uh, Clinton Avenue. We actually had a day that we had um, rented a crane to come and do a number of them and just went like this, one to another to another. Two of those were the ones that you were on Thomas Landers Road. Yep. And <clears throat> we're still having issues on Thomas Landers Road. Yep. And then this is the manpower. Um, this is a 16 foot four by four post with about 100 pounds of pressure treated lumber on top of it. Um, you can see that we kind of we put some of the supports on first so that we could manhandle it and raise it in the sky. And you can see it dropped into the hole. As just about five minutes after we did this, an osprey flew by us. <laughs> this map here is kind of showing where we put all of our nests. It's up here when you need to um, notice both of our spouses are leaving. This is typical. <laughs> it's fine. So um, this is up here, and you can take a closer look at it, but we put little dots where the nests are, the, the platforms are. and. The good news is that um, about 17 of the 25 were, had chicks on them this year. So that's a pretty good first year. So these birds are the um, Royal Magansett birds. That's where Le the Leah Manila Foundation platform is. We have three in this nest. So if you look at the, the top right, um, if you notice this, this bird is doing what they call pancaking. And it's, it's basically a, a way that they can hide from predators. And they'll just basically lay down in the nest. If you notice these nests, in the spring, they seem very active. They'll be a male and a female constantly. And then all of a sudden, there's nothing. You don't see anything, no activity around these nests. And most of the time, that's because the female is pancaking on top of her eggs. So she'll sit there with her eggs a little bit spread back to the sky, and you can't see them when they're on that nest. Quite remarkable, actually. So the next part of this is where do we go now? Um, we really are continuing to try to work with Eversource to do more deterrence, expand the uh, number of poles that they're deterring in one area so that birds don't just get bumped off of one and then go right down the road to the next. So they are. Um, having more discussions and we don't give up and we do keep having a little bit of progress as as time goes on so we're hopeful that over this next year we will be able to correct more and more of this we certainly have cut way back on our problems this year than what we've had in the past yep. and as you all know any of you who are following on Facebook on fabulous Falmouth or the Falmouth wildlife you know that you're seeing Kevin and I constantly being told, like tattled on about things that are happening with different birds or especially the osprey. The phone rings a lot. Kevin gets called or I'll get called because someone's got a bird on a chimney. Someone's got a bird that's down, on, down in the yard. Someone's got a bird that got rained on in the storm and couldn't fly. And then that's where you'll see me taking pictures and Kevin's holding a thing, this little thing wrapped in towels. Um, but we are really careful about interfering with nature if it is at all something that can be left and 
hopefully gets back on its feet or back up in the nest, we're leaving it. And we're not calling Cape Wildlife in right. all the time. And they are actually filled at this time of year with so many babies, mm -hmm. chicks. So we're, we're making rules as we go. One of the rules is if there's a private person who has a problem with a chimney uh, nest, that is not under our purview, but that will be under Kevin's company's little private thing that he can help that person get their own permit and he can help build them a platform if they're allowed to by the, by the town. So we're trying to keep our rules. Remember that the project was to help us stop power problems and fires and birds dying. And um, then, yet that doesn't mean that there aren't other problems. So if we look at this, that's the picture that we showed earlier. There's a nest under the T-bar and another bird standing on a telephone pole. Yeah. The bottom, this is the exact same telephone pole. You can see the platform with the fishing rod. Um, birds have moved to that. In, in lieu of the one with the black barrel. Yeah. That black barrel is unbelievably effective. Um, yeah. I'm not real sure why they don't import it everywhere. It's not the most sightly looking thing. I think I it's admit. the time it takes to put but it up. But yeah, it, it takes a little bit of time to put those up. So like Barbara was saying about the, um, the rescuing and helping these osprey, um, a lot of what we do is We'll go out and find a bird that's on the ground, and it just gets thrown up in the air. We found one on Sandwich Road, and it had traffic backed up for 15, 20 minutes until I could get there. Somebody called me on Facebook, and we get over there, and there's traffic backed up both directions, a police car in the middle of the road, and this bird was up against this guy's car barking at everyone. Um, so I, we came over, grabbed a towel, picked him up, got him off the road, let traffic kind of ease again and then just climbed up a hill out by the, the little power grid, wherever, what is that one? At the end of Hayway and yeah, Sandwich yeah, Road? Right. It's right there, there's a transfer station. And up that hill, there was a, a nest on top of a high tension pole. That nest got destroyed during one of the storms the we had. Storm we had yeah. And the birds weren't quite fledged yet. So we went up to the top of the hill, threw the bird in the air, he flew about 100 yards. Um, back towards the road, unfortunately. So we went, picked him up, threw him again. <laughs> and this time, he flew up along the power lines and landed in a tree. And now, every time we go by there, we still see one of the parents sitting up on that pole. So we know that that bird is still fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Very interesting. And then this again, this is the same pole. Completely different result. So we need to see more of this. And one thing that we, neither one of us has mentioned yet is we are not trying to let the osprey increase their population. Right. We're not adding additional nesting sites. We're adding replacement nesting sites. So we get a phone call for a while there. It was two or three times a day. I'd have somebody call me, oh, we want to put an osprey platform in our yard. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll pay Where, how close to you are the of the nearest power pole that has a problem. So oh, there's no power poles with osprey nests anywhere near me. Well, unfortunately, we can't help you. And people don't like to hear that, but that's the way it is. We're not, we're not trying to expand the population. We're trying to take the known population that we have and make their lives a little bit easier, a little bit safer. That was an absolute agreement we had at the beginning with the Conservation Commission yep. is that this was not about... It's a one-for-one. One. Yes, one-for-one one is it. So that's what you're going to see going forward, only correcting problems that exist. And uh, we will continue to hope to work with Eversource. And with that, we also, when you uh, leave tonight, if you're at all interested in anything else that we've said, we've got little cards here. We've certainly got a Facebook page for the Osprey Project. And um, we're happy to answer questions. Does anybody have any questions? Are you guys itching to get out of here? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, for, particularly for a bird specialist like you, we had an unusual situation two years ago where eagles took over an osprey nest. Okay, so that's a funny thing. And then thing. the osprey came back and reclaimed yep. it. 
Okay. So that, that happened in an oyster pond. There's an osprey nest in a tree, in an, a, a God's honest natural nest, an oyster pond. How cool is that? So last winter, the juvenile bald eagles, there, there was two of them that have been flying around town for the last couple of years, just becoming more and more sexually mature. We believe they came from Plymouth, not 100%. Um, funny thing about bald eagles is they're kind of pansies. An osprey will have a field day beating up a, a bald eagle. Those zygodactyl feet make tremendous weapons. So the osprey will drive eagles out of their nests. A lot of things try to take over osprey nests. There was an osprey nest in um, Mashpee at the Wampanoag building. That is no longer an osprey nest because a great horned owl decided that it wanted it. And they can win. Great horned owl is the only thing in the world that will move an osprey. Yep. They will move anything. Yep. Yep. They will eat porcupines. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So I was just wondering, uh, when they take off and go 2,000 miles away, yes. how, how long do they fly before they have to rest? Like, well, um, like we said, Belle flew 2,700 miles. It took her 13 days. So. I would, I would say that there's not an awful lot of effort involved. Um, I think they get high and kind of follow winds. They do a lot of soaring. Yeah. Um, and they'll, they'll stop to rest along the way. But they also, our osprey here, have the problem of the year-round osprey that they have to leapfrog. Those two populations do not, yeah. they don't mingle at all. Not real sure why. But our migrating birds are slightly larger than the year-round ones. Um, they've just evolved to be that way. So that so. gets them south of Cuba. They have yeah. to go south of Cuba before they're away from the permanent right. residence. So I would imagine that they kind of take it leisurely until they get down to about the Carolinas, and then they start to get a little uneasy and skip. So I would say that they probably are going from the Carolinas to Jamaica, probably. In one, in one shot. And their predators are, are who? Great horned owls. Yeah. That's really, owls. really about it. And human interaction and yeah. just natural accidents. Yeah, most, most predation of osprey is going to be the young, um, yeah. raccoons, fishers, um, rats. Believe it or not. Um, That's why we actually put guards around all of our poles. So yeah, we have them. Alum, aluminum mm -hmm. sheeting. Mm -hmm. So a raccoon will climb up there. Oh, a raccoon yeah. will absolutely climb mm -hmm. a pole. It will. Yeah. They're not ours, though, they won't. Yeah, and the Norway rats <laughs> um, will climb the poles to yeah. eat the eggs. Um, squirrels will try to get into these nests to eat eggs. I think there was a question in the back, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Was there a question back? Asked. Okay, great. Thank you. In terms of identifying individual osprey, are there some sort of unique markings that you can look at in a photo well, that you'd be able to tell one individual from another? For the most part, no. Um, if you look at this bird here, you can see there's a few specks. They're, they're all individually different in that one little spot. But you would have to have photographs. And you'd have to really study it, kind of like they do with the humpback whales. Whale the flukes, on right. The flukes. That's what we do with flukes. So you just it, study them. If you really, I mean, you could do it if you were so inclined. You could take pictures. And sometimes I can tell which bird it is as it's flying by me based on location, where it came from, whether it's the male or the female from whichever nest. Um, the masks are just the tiniest bit different. Yeah, just... yeah but they're, they're pretty uniform looking. They do vary from continent to continent slightly, but um, this, is, this is the second most widespread bird on the face of the earth. The peregrine falcon is the only bird that, takes, that um, lives in more places. The only place that the osprey is not found is Antarctica. He had gone, how yes, sir. You had mentioned that the ospreys uh, are large, they breed in the northern hemisphere and they largely are there raptors that do the reverse? I don't believe there are. So why I don't, is that? I don't know. The earth is a crazy thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand why things don't migrate to the southern hemisphere to breed this, you know, in the winter. It's, it's all about the northern hemisphere. I don't, 
I don't understand. I don't know if it dates back to all the way to Pangea when everything was in there. Who knows? They, you know, evolution's a crazy thing. But um, yeah, I'm not real sure why why they don't they don't breed in South America, but they don't. There's zero osprey nests in the entire continent of South America because they don't need the nest to just hang out. Yeah, yes, ma'am. The, they won't. Osprey, osprey are a very slow to develop bird. Um, let's see. It, it's about 50 to 55, 50 days, to 55 days after they hatch mm -hmm. until they fledge. Yeah. And then you've got 36 to 42 days of the egg being there. So it's, it's just to too late. There was one year when we had a hurricane force wind come in around this time exactly in August. And a lot of the osprey actually left at that time already, if you can yeah. imagine. And I'm, we're all seeing some of them that just barely started flying. Yeah, yeah so. a lot of, if you look around town right now, you'll, you'll notice that most of the females have gone. They, they tend to take off the second to third week of August, mm -hmm. followed shortly by the males and then the juveniles. But I don't know why they do it, but the females leave first. They are done. I could tell you why. <laughs> yeah. well, well, the funny thing about the, I, we forgot to mention earlier that um, osprey are one of these birds who they share incubation duties. So you can be sitting watching an osprey nest and you'll see a bird sitting there on the eggs. And then you see another bird fly in. It lands. The other one stands up, flies out, and then this one lays on the eggs. Blew my mind the first time I saw it. Yeah, but he also has observed one male feeding three different nests. So you know, yes. don't, get, don't be thinking they're so wonderful. Yeah. Lenny, yeah. did you have? Yeah. She's got one. Okay, three. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So the mother's gone now. The father's still hanging out. The babies are all self-sufficient, can feed themselves now? Not, not quite. Not yet? The, the males, well, there was a study in, the there's a study in Michigan where somebody claimed that osprey are, are born with the innate ability to hunt. In my mind, that makes no sense. And he based that all on the fact that he saw an osprey catch a fish two days after it fledged. Mm. Okay, well, I, the other day, I was sitting over at the Monat Yacht Club, and there were three or two juvenile osprey and an adult male. They were doing their little chirpy thing. Blah, 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 blah. The male took off. The juveniles took off. I watched them as the male circled. The juveniles went up and circled with him. He came down out of the sky, grabbed a fish, flew back up into the sky. The juveniles flew directly to the nest, and then he flew to the nest and gave them a fish. To me, that, that seems like some sort of a teaching or learning situation. I've actually watched the ones where we have a, a dock and a railing on the dock, and I have watched the male give fishing lessons where they will, just like you teach a kid to go to the end of the diving board and go like this, they will all go and he'll have them all hang their heads down like this and they just stare at the pond until all of a sudden you'll see them just drop down. It's the most humorous thing to watch every year. Do they practice a lot? Because we see them flying in yes. the pond about us on Great Pond. Yeah. They're flying and then they'll come down, but then they go back up. Well, a lot, of times, a lot of times they abort. They, they, it'll yeah. come down and, oh, no, the fish moved. Yeah. And then, okay. so they, I didn't know if it was a practice. Because it's a lot, like it's a, it takes a lot of energy for them to get into the water, yeah. get back out of the water. And then they do this thing where they shake like a dog, which yeah. is kind of neat. They fly up and then stop flapping and boom. You see this big spray, and then they continue flying. Just remember, it's, though, a good adult is one out of four dives, right? So think of where a juvenile would be. Um, so the, do the juveniles then follow the father, the, the, father, the male, or, or they go? They, go? they just know they're supposed to go south. They end up so in their they, own. And they get left behind. Yeah. They're usually still a week or two at least. So they yes. They're yeah, on we've, had, we've had juveniles stay here as late as Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the Probably didn't make it. In, in the, on the Cape and in Falmouth? Well, in Falmouth, we, right now, Kevin has identified 139 known nests in Falmouth. 
Um, so that equates to about 240. Yeah. Uh, two, 280 yeah. Thank you for coming. You know what we can do? We can actually let people go that want to go. If you have a few extra questions you want to come up and ask us, please feel free to do that. But thank you. Thank you.